This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now, from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here is Pastor Jordan Easley. You know, in the latter part of the 1800s, there was a man named Edwin Thomas. And Edwin Thomas was a master of the stage. He was a small man that had a massive voice. And in the world of theater, in the world of the arts, this guy was second to none. Seriously, one of the best of the best. Edwin also had two brothers. Their names were John and Junius. And both of these guys were actors as well. In fact, in the year 1863, his brother John landed a massive role, the role of Brutus, the assassin, in the play Julius Caesar. And the reason that's so interesting to me is because that same John, just two years later, took on the role of an assassin in real life as well. See, what I failed to mention earlier about this guy named Edwin Thomas was that his full name was Edwin Thomas Booth. And his brother John was John Wilkes Booth, the man who entered into the Ford's Theater in April of 1865, snuck into the rear of a private box, and then fired a bullet into the head of President Abraham Lincoln. Well, as you can imagine, Edwin Booth was never the same after that happened. Shame from his brother's incident and his crime, it drove him into an early retirement. And his plan was to stay retired forever. In fact, he probably would have if it wasn't for this unique, crazy incident that happened in a New Jersey train station. See, on that day, Edwin Booth was waiting to board a train when all of a sudden, a sharp-dressed young man lost his footing and fell onto the tracks. Well, with the train quickly approaching, Edwin reacted without thinking. He jumped onto the track. He grabbed the young man. He pulled him to safety. And in that moment, once the young man realized that he was okay, he looked up to see who saved him, and he recognized Edwin's face. He knew who he was. Edwin didn't know the young man. But a couple weeks later, he received a letter in the mail from the office of General Ulysses S. Grant thanking Edwin Booth for heroically saving the life of Robert Todd Lincoln, the son of Abraham Lincoln. He carried that letter with him until the day that he died. To me, that story is pretty crazy. It's pretty ironic as well when you think about it. Because you've got one brother that killed the president of the United States, and another brother that saved the president's son, Edwin and John Booth. They had the same father. They had the same mother. They had the same profession. They even had the same passions. And yet one brother chose life and one brother chose death. You know, in this Bible that we read every week, you find a lot of stories just like that. You've got Cain and you've got Abel. Both were sons of Adam. One chose God and the other chose murder. And you know what? God let him choose murder. You got Abraham and you've got Lot. Both of these guys are pilgrims in Canaan. Abraham chose God. Lot chose Sodom. And God let him choose Sodom. You've got David and you've got Saul. Both of them are kings in Israel. David chose God. Saul chose power. And God let him choose power. You got Peter. You got Judas. Both of these guys denied their Lord and Savior. And yet you see Peter seeking mercy. Judas seeks death. And you know what? God let him choose death. On nearly every single page of this Bible, we are reminded that God allows us to make our own choices. And according to Jesus, when you look at Matthew chapter 7, he says we can choose the narrow gate, we can choose the wide gate. We can choose the narrow road. We can choose the wide road. We can choose the big crowd. We can choose the small crowd. 
He goes on to say, we can choose to, to build on the rock. We can build on the sand. We can choose to serve God or we can serve riches. We can be numbered among the sheep. We can be numbered among the goats. But God gives us the opportunity to make those choices. Some of those are temporal choices, but God also allows us to make eternal choices. And he shows us in his word that eternal choices, choices have eternal consequences. In fact, I heard one author put it this way. He said, life comes with voices. Voices lead to choices and choices have consequences. I believe every single one of us here today could raise our hand and we can say, listen, I can agree with this. You can say, I've listened to the voices, right? And, and those voices have led me to make choices. And we could all say today that those choices in our life have led us to where we are today. And we're talking about mentally and physically and spiritually and emotionally, even financially. We can say, because of those choices, I am where I am today. Well, let me show you why that's so significant and why it's so important. It was Ken Blanchard that put it this way. He said, choice, not chance, determines destiny. It's the choices in our life that leads to the destination of our life. And, and that's been true, yes, in, in our day, but all the way back in the very beginning of time. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you're going to see how a choice changed the world. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3 today. And from Genesis chapter 3, the first thing we're going to see is the conversation with the adversary. There's a conversation that happens in chapter 3, and I want us to take note of it today. See, in the book of Genesis, everything was perfect in chapters 1 and 2. Everything. The place was perfect. The provisions were perfect. Even the people were perfect in chapters 1 and 2. It was like heaven on earth. But then you get to chapter 3, and everything changed. And then if you keep reading on to chapter 4 you see that there's a residual carryover, right? Those changes that happened in chapter three carried over to chap ch chapter four. And in chapter four, you see jealousy for the first time. You see anger, you see murder, you see lying, you see rebellion, you see greed, you see judgment. The list goes on and on and on. And when you hear that, you're probably prone to ask the question, why? Why did everything change? What happened on planet earth? Well, let me tell you. Chapter three happened. The changes that happened were consequences that resulted from a choice, a choice that was made in a single conversation. And this conversation happened between a serpent and Eve, a serpent and Eve. And in their dialogue, what we're going to see, Adam and Eve got deceived by the devil. They got deceived by the snake. And he has been deceiving people ever since that moment in the garden. And here's how the conversation with the snake went. And I want you to pay close attention today because the scheme of the devil in Genesis chapter 3 is the same scheme that he uses in your life and he uses in my life. And here's what he did, first and foremost. He cast doubt on the word of God. He cast doubt on the word of God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Right here, beginning in verse 1, we find the serpent. By the way, if you're new to this story, that's just the devil wrapped in snakeskin. Okay? That's all it is. This is the devil wrapped in snakeskin, and he is striking up a conversation with Adam's wife. The, the Bible describes him as, look at it, the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. You see that word cunning? That word in the literal language, it, it means crafty or shrewd. Another word for cunning is the word clever. He's the most clever creation that God ever created. And I find it interesting that this clever snake approached Eve rather than approaching Adam. Have you ever thought about that? He slipped into Adam's family, and Adam didn't even realize it. You read over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Think about that for a second. By the way, I don't think that that was written to take a shot at women, but I do believe that it was recorded to be a warning to men. 
So men, make this message a message that you're gonna receive today. And listen, this is what it's saying. It's saying, men, we gotta pay attention here. You gotta pay attention to what's taking place in your home. This should remind us that we should keep our guard up in our home. We should keep our head on a swivel in our home. We should keep our eyes open and our ears aware of what Satan is trying to do under our roof. You see, Satan is sneaky. He's clever. And he loves slipping undetected into the core of our families and destroying us from the inside out. Listen, that is a victory for the devil. If he can destroy your home, it's a victory for him. Serpent's been doing this for a long time. And in this passage, he was talking to Eve for one main reason. And let me tell you why. It was to cast doubt upon the word of God. Learn this about the devil today. He is a clever, sneaky liar. And he lies in a way that is effective. You say, what does an effective lie look like? Well, let me tell you. The most effective lie is the lie that sounds like the truth. The most effective lie is a lie that sounds like the truth. That's the way the devil works. Notice in this passage, the devil didn't come to Adam and Eve and say, hey, guys, God isn't real. You know why he didn't say that? Because he knew that they knew that God was real. He didn't come to Adam and Eve and say, hey, guys, I got to tell you something. God doesn't love you. You know why? Because he knew that they knew that God loved them. In verse one, he takes a completely different approach. And what does he do? He asks them a question. He says, hey, did God really say? You see, he began this conversation with Eve by planting a tiny seed of doubt in her heart. His intention was to put a question mark where God put a period. By the way, this is the very first question that was ever asked in the word of God. And it was a question that raised doubt concerning the word of God. By the way, let let this just be a reminder to all of us today. Anytime a doubt is raised concerning the word of God, anytime the validity of scripture happens in our world, that ought to be a red flag letting us know that the devil is behind that, number one, and that he's up to no good. He was certainly up to no good in the garden that day because he casted doubt upon the word of God. And do you see how Eve responded when that happened? Here's what you can see. She altered the word of God. In that moment, she altered the word of God. Look at verse two. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Let me ask you a question today. Is that what God told her? Have you ever seen that before? She altered the word of God. That's not what God said at all. Look back at what he said in Genesis chapter two, verse 17. He said, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for on that day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Right away, we see that she altered the word of God. She left a word out. She left the word out certainly in verse 17. And then she said that God told her not to touch the tree when God didn't say that. Which means not only did she alter the word of God, listen, she added to the word of God. Maybe you're thinking today, man, that's not a big deal. You're talking about a couple of different words. This is nitpicky stuff. I mean, this is like a, you're trying to make much of something that's not a big deal at all. She altered the word of God. She changed the word of God. She added to the word of God. Listen to me today. Anytime someone alters the word of God or adds to the word of God, it is a big deal. It's a big deal. We got a lot of people that want to have their own version of God's word today. Let me just tell you, that ought to be a red flag for every person that actually knows the word of God. Because here's the thing, when you become okay with altering the word of God, when you become okay with adding to the word of God, you are one step away from abandoning the word of God. And that's exactly what Eve did in this passage. And it all started with what? One tiny seed of doubt. You see, after casting doubt upon the word of God, the next thing I want you to see in this passage is the denial of the word of God. Verse four says, no, you will certainly not die the serpent said to the woman. You see it loud and clear. Listen, it's a short step from doubting God's word to completely denying God's word. You can almost hear him saying, hey, come on, man, this doesn't apply to you. God said that back then. That doesn't apply to you today. This is a different world. This is a different culture. You were born differently. This is a different kind of word for you. Certainly God didn't mean that this word applies to you. You will certainly not die. 
This is a great example of Satan substituting a lie for the truth. And Eve chose to believe the devil's lies, and she chose not to believe God's truth. And I want you to notice that there was only one word difference between what God said and what the devil said. One word. God said, you will certainly die. The devil's like, you will certainly not die, right? Listen, today, there are millions of graves on the earth that will testify to the truthfulness of what God was trying to say in that moment. And I want you to notice the progression here. You've got the devil casting doubt upon the word of God, and then you have him denying the word of God. But that's not the only thing we see. The third thing is the distortion of the word of God. The word of God was being distorted. Let me say this. Every cult in America was born out of the distortion of the word of God. That's how they create cults. The recipe is pretty simple for a cult. Here's what they do. They take 90% truth and they mix it with 10% error. And then they mix it together like in a big pot and they create their own belief system. Well, here's the problem with that. If something is only 90% true, then it's 100% false. If it's 90% true and 10% wrong, it's 100% false. So how did the devil distort the word of God? Well, look at what he told him in verse five. He said, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Well, here's the thing. Eve already knew the difference between good and evil, but the devil distorted the word of God and convinced her that she could know good and evil. Look at the words like God. He distorted God's word and presented a half truth. And in doing so, he convinced her of a lie. And he said, Eve, listen, you can be liberated here. You can go to the next level here. Your eyes can be opened here. You can experience freedom in ways that you can't even think or imagine. It's going to be awesome. You can have it all as long as you do what I say. The conversation with the serpent. The second thing I want you to see is the choices that were made. You see, just like in our conversations, we make choices there were choices that were made in this conversation as well. I read this week that the average person in the world makes 35 choices or decisions every single day. And when I, when I read that, I started sweating just thinking about it. It stresses me out to think about that. I'm making 35,000 decisions every single day. I mean, have you ever stopped to just count how many times you make a choice from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed? I mean, it stresses me out just thinking about it. I, I, every time I go to Cheesecake Factory, I think I'm going to break out in hives, right? <laughs> I start combing through the novel, and man, it, I'm like, I got to make the right choice here. And I, I'm stressed out because I, I've got so many choices. And then when I finally do make a choice, then I start thinking about all the decisions that I didn't make. I'm like, well, I could have made that choice. I could have made that choice, you know? And then the dessert menu is a whole other ball game. Anybody else have a problem with this? Listen, we make a lot of choices every single day. And when you think about it, it really helps you understand that really everywhere you go, there are choices to be made. You go to the grocery store after church. You'll know what I'm talking about. Did you know there's 85 different variations of crackers at the grocery store right now? 85. My kids asked me just a couple weeks ago, Dad, can you pick up some goldfish? I went, I went to, the, to, to, to Publix and I was like, I got to get some goldfish. You know how many variations of goldfish there are at Publix? 21. I counted them. <laughs> when you're talking about different flavors, different shapes and sizes, there are 21 different variations of goldfish in your local grocery store. So, and that really is all categories. I promise. If your wife tells you, go to the grocery store after church and pick up some chocolate chip cookies, you know how many chocolate chip cookie variations? 42. I counted them. I did my research, people. There are 42 different variations of chocolate chip cookies. Everywhere you look, if you pay attention you'll see there are a lot of choices that we have to make. And you know what? Sometimes we get it right and we make good choices. Other times you don't get it right and you make bad choices. And that's what we see in Genesis chapter three. We see bad choices being made repeatedly. In verses one through five, here's what we've seen. Eve chose to listen to the devil. Let me tell you something. That's always a bad choice. If you're listening to the devil, it's a bad choice. But then you get to verse six. And in verse six, there are four choices that were made that were bad choices. And I want you to see those today. The first one in verse six is that Eve chose to believe the devil's lies over God's truth. 
And we are faced with that same opportunity today. You can believe the devil's lies. You can believe God's truth. But she missed it. Look at verse six. It says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. That's a setup. And I want you to notice how it all began. How did this horrible decision begin? Did you notice how it began? It said, the woman saw. Say that word with me. The woman saw. Listen, if someone ever says to you, come on, man, there is no harm in looking. Let me tell you, those people don't know what they're talking about. The devil loves it when you start looking. The devil loves it when your eyes start to wander. And let me tell you why. Because he is a master at taking a look and turning it into lust. When Eve saw that tree, I think she had lustful eyes for that tree. In fact, I believe when she saw that tree, she saw three things. She saw a tree that would make her stronger and it appealed to her physically. She saw a tree that was pleasant to her eyes. It said that she delighted to look at it and it appealed to her emotionally. She saw a tree that would make her wise. She wanted to be like God. And I believe that appealed to her pride. Let me tell you what's wrong with that. John tells us in 1 John chapter two that all those things are wrong. Verse 16 says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride in one's possessions is not from the father, it's from the world. That's a recipe for disaster. And we should know that. When you think about it, that's the exact same recipe the devil used when he was tempting Jesus in the garden. He appealed to him physically by offering bread to eat when he was hungry. He appealed to him emotionally by offering him the possessions of the world. He appealed to his pride by offering world recognition. And it all started with one thing, a tiny seed of doubt that was planted. See, Eve chose to listen to the devil. She chose to believe the devil's lies instead of God's truth. But the next thing that I want you to see in verse six is this. Eve chose to follow the devil's path over God's plan. His path over God's plan. Verse six goes on to say, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. Here's what you see in that passage. Ultimately, Eve's desire turned into a decision. It started with a desire. And we've all got desires, but she did something with the desire and the desire became a decision. Have you ever experienced that in your own life? Where a sinful desire turned into a sinful decision. That's what happened in her story. And that's what happens so often in our stories. Here's something I want you to take notice of today. The devil didn't force her to sin. He didn't coerce her to sin. He didn't have to. And in the same way, the devil can't push you to sin, but he can persuade you to sin. There's persuasion in all of our stories and the devil constantly persuades us to sin. He persuaded Eve to sin, but you know what? She decided to do it. And when she took a bite of the apple, in that bite, sin entered the world and Eve became a slave. Mark it down. In fact, in John chapter eight, verse 34, Jesus said, truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. That's what sin does. Sin is, is something that puts us in slavery. It puts you in bondage with the devil himself. You know what else sin is? It's addictive. You choose to listen to gossip and it may seem harmless, but before long you'll look up and you're no longer just listening to the gossip, you're participating. And now you are choosing to partake in the sin instead of fleeing the sin like Jesus tells you to flee. You know what flee means? It means run, go, get out of the way. Don't be in that environment. But that's the way it works. You choose to compromise your purity once and do something you shouldn't be doing outside of the bond of marriage. Guess what? That second time is right around the corner. And that third time is waiting in the wings. But that's the way that sin works. All sin puts you in slavery and all sin is addictive. And once you start, it's hard to stop. Here's the passage. Eve chose to follow the devil's path over God's plan. Let me show you something else in verse six that she did. She chose to entice her husband. You see that in the passage? It says, so she took some of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her. 
You know what I've learned about sin over the years? I've learned it's much easier to justify your sin if you can get other people to sin alongside you. Would you agree with that? Shake your head, a bunch of sinners. All right, shake your heads. <laughs> it's a lot easier, isn't it? Nobody wants to sin by themselves. It's a lot easier to justify your sin if you can get your boys to sin with you, your girlfriends to sin with you, your people to sin. If you can get people sinning with you, it's a lot easier to justify you see, in this story, Eve didn't want to commit the sin alone. So what does she do? She, as the sinner, became a seducer. And that's true about all of us. Sinners are seducers. They entice the people around them to join them. And you can just imagine this conversation between Adam and Eve. She's like, come on, Adam, be a man, right? Make your decision. It's going to be fine. You, you can do this. You're with me. I'm your, I'm your wife. Do what I tell you to do, right? I mean, Adam was seduced in that moment. And as a result, the Bible says sin entered humanity. But that's not where verse 6 stops. There's one more thing I want to point out, and that is Adam chose to join Eve in her rebellion. This wasn't all on Eve. Guess what? He was at fault as well. It says, so she took some of its fruit and ate. She gave she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and check this out, and he ate it. You see that? That was his decision. Once again, nobody forced him to sin. No one coerced him to sin. He made a personal choice as a man, and he chose disobedience to God. You got the conversation with the adversary. You have the choices that were made. But the last thing I want to point out is this, the consequences of their actions. The consequences of their actions. I don't have to convince you of this because you already know this, but sin has consequences. Sin always has consequences. There's no way to avoid the consequences of sin. And we can see that plain as day in this story. Look at verse eight. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let's stop right there for one second. Let me just say this. If you're trying to play hide and go seek from God, you're going to lose. You cannot hide from the God of the universe. And a lot of times we feel guilty from our sin. We're trying to run away from God. You cannot run so far away that God cannot find you. And that's what happened in this story. Verse 9 says, So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It's the dumbest excuse I've ever heard. I was naked, God, so I'm hiding from you. No, that's not why you're hiding. You're hiding because of the shame in your heart, not the shame of your body. You're shameful because you sinned. And you know what? There's consequences for sin. And when you see the consequences laid out in this text, it says they were hiding from God, but the consequence is now they're separated from God. Their sin caused separation. And now for the very first time in all humanity, God's creation is separated from the creator. And that's a big deal. But the bigger deal for us today is what I want to point out, and that is the separation that they experienced was not the result of God moving. Listen, God didn't move. They were separated because they moved. They moved away from God. They made the personal choice to pursue sin rather than to pursue him. Have you ever found yourself far from God? Have you ever been walking through a season where you felt like God was a million miles away? Well, guess what? God didn't move. He didn't leave you. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, he says that he never would. In that verse, it says, For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. God doesn't turn his back on us. But when we choose sin instead of choosing him, we essentially turn our backs on God. We are sinners, and sin has a consequence. That's what sin does. It separates us from God. But I want you to see in this text that not only did their sin separate them from God, it also separated them from each other. I mean, look at it in verse 12. It says that in verse 12, Adam blamed his wife. Check it out. The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. This is a horrible example of great communication in marriage. They're playing the blame game like champs, right? I mean, they created it in this text. And so he's having this conversation with the Lord. He's like, yeah, yeah, I did sin. I'm naked and I sinned. 
my bad, but this isn't really my bad. It's her bad. Listen, she's the one who gave me the fruit. And so he starts by blaming his wife. And then you see him quickly shift the blame back to God. He's like, by the way, that woman who you gave me, you gave me the woman. I wouldn't be in this mess if you didn't hook me up with, with Eve. This is your fault as the God of the universe. You gave me the woman. The woman gave me the business. And now I'm, in, I'm a sinner. You know, I mean, it's like this whole progression. And you look at it, and you're like, okay, the blame game is off and running. And then it really continues on when you keep reading in verse 13. It says, now the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Are you seeing what's happening here? The sin is being addressed in their life, and, and he's like, it's her fault, it's your fault. And she's like, no, it's not. It's the snake's fault, and everybody's pointing fingers, and no one is looking at themselves. Let me say this today. The only person you can blame for your sin is you. It's not anybody else's fault. You can be persuaded. You can, you can be pushed, but no one can force you to dive into a lifestyle sin. Listen, it is our choice. And the Bible says this applies to all of us. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person is here. It doesn't matter how, how slick you look, how polished you are, how perfect you appear to be. Listen, it, at the heart of the matter, you are a sinner, I'm a sinner. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And the scary part about this is this. Sin always has a consequence. It has a consequence. And it always will. You're like, That's really bad news. It's bad news. But let me share some good news with you. Sin not only has consequences... Sin also has a conqueror. And the conqueror's name is Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people, because all sinned. And then verse 18 goes on to say, So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act, there is justification leading to life for everyone. You see, what we lost in Adam, we gained through Jesus. And that's why it's so important that you hear this today. That's why it's so important that you're born again. Because when you're born once, you can be born into a good family and you can be a good person, but you're still born spiritually dead. But the Bible says when you're born twice, you're then able to obtain a new, complete, abundant life. That's why you've got to choose Jesus. When the Holy Spirit leads you and invites you into a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that's why it's so important that you choose him instead of choosing whatever it is you've been choosing your whole life. Listen, you may be a person that's here today saying, man, if I would have only done this, or if I would have only done that, if I would have only chosen this, or if I would have only chosen that, and you're starting to reflect over all the things in your past, guess what? It's not too late to make the right decision. You still can. In fact, one good choice for eternity offsets a thousand bad choices on planet earth. And I believe the Bible indicates that if your heart is beating today and your lungs are breathing today, then God is still giving you the power to choose him. Have you chosen him? Max Lucado talked about that in his book, Glory Days. I read this quote this week and I thought, man, this is a perfect way to close this message. He said, when Jesus was on the middle cross, he had thieves on either side. How could two men see the same Jesus and one choose to mock him and the other choose to pray to him? I don't know, but they did. And when one prayed, Jesus loved him enough to save him. And when the other mocked, Jesus loved him enough to let him. He allowed him the choice. And he does the same for you. Let me ask you a question today. 
What choice are you going to make in this moment for Jesus? I believe like the two brothers that we started talking about just a while ago, Edwin and John, one chose life and one chose death. I believe we essentially will make the same choice today. There will be people here today that say, man, I have chosen, I have chosen life in Jesus. But there's some here today, if they're being brutally honest, they would say, I, in my life choices, have chosen death. Maybe you're even a good person. Maybe you've worked really hard to become a better version of yourself. Maybe you go to church or you watch church online. Maybe you're, you're thinking over the course of your life, and you're like, I'm a generous person, I'm a nice person, I've got good manners, I was born in a good family. But still, at the heart of the issue, you've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've never died to yourself and been made alive in Christ. You've been born one time, not two times. And essentially, the Bible says even good people can miss God and go to hell for eternity. But some would say, man, I've, I've done those things. I've, I've entered into a real relationship with Jesus and I've chosen life. And there's somebody that might need to make that decision today. Say, man, for my entire life, I've, I've chosen death. I've chosen to do things my own way. I've been the Lord and Savior of my own life. And yet I've been reminded that I can't save myself and I can't guarantee myself an eternity in heaven. Only Jesus can do that. So how do you choose life today? Here's what I believe you, the Bible says. The Bible says if you're gonna choose life in Jesus, the first thing you need to do is repent. It means turn around. In other words, I've been heading this way, the wrong way for a really long time. And the Bible says there has to be a moment where you choose to turn around and go in the opposite direction. I've been choosing sin and the things of the world and, and money and popularity and all the things the world has to offer. And, and in a moment, I'm choosing to turn around and to trust Jesus with all of that stuff. But I'm going to pursue him and him alone. He's gonna become my Lord, my boss, the one that's in charge, the one that dictates the direction of my life. It starts with repenting of our sin and turning to him. But it's more than just repenting and turning. It's, it's also believing. And the Bible says that in order to choose life and be saved, you have to believe that Jesus is who he says he was, that he is God the Son and the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, sinless life, died a brutal death so that we could have life in him. Then he raised again on the third day and he's alive right now and he's coming back for his kids. Do you believe that today? For if you're willing to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus and believe that he truly is who he says he is, there's one more step I think that we've got to take and that is we've got to choose to run to Jesus every single day. The Bible says that we've got to take up our cross daily and we've got to pursue Christ. That means that you need him. You need his Holy Spirit. You need his presence and his power to accomplish what he put you on this earth to accomplish. You see, this life was never designed to be about us. It's about the glory of God. It's about our life reflecting the glory of God to other people so that this world could be changed for him and by him. It's about making disciples. It's about investing in eternal things. It's about living our life, pointing people to the hope of Jesus Christ, understanding that we are sons and daughters of the one true King. That's why we're here. This is about him. It's about his name being glorified. It's about his presence being magnified. It's about the kingdom of God being expanded through who you are and how you live. So let me ask you a question. Have you chosen life? Are you alive in Christ today? Are you a new creation that's been born twice, never to be the same again? Man, if that's you, celebrate that today. Don't take that for granted. Celebrate that you're a new creation. Celebrate the hope that you have. But if you don't have that assurance today, if you have a question mark next to your eternal destination, would you choose Jesus today? Would you choose him? unashamedly choose him, unashamedly choose life, his path, his purpose, and put everything else on the shelf. I wanna give you the opportunity to do that today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? There may be somebody that's within the sound of my voice today that says, man, for the first time and for all time, I wanna choose Jesus. I wanna unashamedly choose Jesus in this moment. I know I need him. Would you just tell him that today? Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to make me a new person. 
I need you to give me purpose and life and hope. And I know that can only come through you. Would you say in this moment, Jesus, I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you as the King and the Lord of my life. I believe that you are who you say you are. And I, in the best way I know how, want to give you 100% of who I am and who I will be. I want my life to make a difference for your kingdom. I want to be a child of God. And from this moment forward, I want my life to bring glory to your name and make a difference for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every single week, this broadcast is being made available to millions of people around the world, which means that every single week, there are scores of people learning God's word, being challenged in their faith, hearing the gospel, and even being saved. God is blessing the expansion of this ministry in a supernatural way. He's using people like you and the generous gifts of Christ's followers all around the world to make this broadcast possible. I want to invite you to consider joining our growing army of all-in friends and become a partner in this ministry. In fact, today, if you give a gift of any amount to this ministry, I'm going to send you a copy of my latest book, Escaping the Cage, just as a way of saying thank you. Thank you for believing in this ministry, and thank you for doing your part to advance the gospel message all around the world. If you would like to give a gift today, you can do that in a number of ways. The first way is you can send a text right now. Text the word BOOK to 74784, or you can visit our website at goallin.tv and then click the Give button. Or you can send a check to All In to the address below. And when you give a gift, just know that you've got a gift coming back to you. As always, any gift that you make to this ministry is tax deductible, and I want to thank you in advance for your partnership and for your prayers. I'm praying God's best for you today as you go all in with Him. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ.